Cape Town, routinely voted one of the most beautiful cities in the world, but it's also one of the most violent, plagued by gangsterism and a sinister organized crime network. But there are law enforcers working tirelessly to bring these criminals to justice. The question is, how much support and protection do they get from their superiors? The assassination of respected detective Charles Kinnear provides clues. Whatever the weather, Nicolette Kinnear lays flowers on her husband's grave weekly. It's become a routine over the 22 months since she became a police widow. My husband was a very firm person. He had a very stern persona, but I think, I think it was because of his job, but he had a heart of gold. He was a hands-on kind of person. What he did, he did with great passion. What he, he believed in what he started, he would finish. That is pretty much how he, he raised the boys as well. If you've committed to something and you've said yes to something, you're gonna to have to finish it. For their sons, Kathleen and Carlisle, time has not erased the memory of the afternoon their dad died. The clock was the last time that I spoke to my dad, so 14.48. And then inside the clock, I have my dad's force number. And then I got a rose and my dad's favorite, one of his favorite flowers was a lily. Charles Kinnear was a decorated police officer who worked on complex cases for the anti-gang unit. A detective who handled high-risk dockets and got convictions. But he was shot in broad daylight, right here outside of his home in Bishop Lavers in his car by a man in a hoodie who fled the scene. This brazen assassination on the 18th of September 2020 sent shockwaves through Cape Town and Charles Kinnear's close community of fellow police officers. I stood at the vehicle for, for a very long time. I just stood there and looked at his lifeless body and had this incredible anger running through me. And then... These are people you build with, you've been through them with, through fire, and then you hand them over to other people, and they die. They die because they were not looked after, despite warnings and despite evidence being there that they are under threat by parties up at national office who have never seen the field. My husband was, was shot five times. From the post-mortem report, he was killed instantly. My boys still had the opportunity to, to kneel with, the, with their dad and to pray with him, etc. By the time I came, it was, it was chaos. Nicoletta is still campaigning to find answers. His colleagues knew her husband was in danger. They'd been alerted that he was being monitored illegally through his phone, but the police had not given him special protection. The 16th, two days prior um, to his assassination, he also got a call um, from one of his senior ranking officers to tell him, where are you? Um, your phone is being excessively pinged. So that is why I said it's like a scenario. We, we're sitting in the parking area and we're just sitting and we, we're watching the bank being robbed and just doing nothing about it. Nicolette believes she's now been vindicated by a report by the Independent Police Investigative Directorate, IPID, which lays bare the fault lines in a factionalized police force too fragmented to protect their own. If the police had done their job, says the report, Charles Kinnear would still be alive. These members have dropped the proverbial ball and must therefore individually and collectively take responsible for the death of their colleague. At the time of his murder, Charles Kinnear was working under General Andre Lincoln, who headed a unit tackling gangs on the Cape Flats. Carte Blanche reported on how it had been set up with much fanfare in 2018. Now retired, Andre lives a simpler life, suffering the loss of limbs due to diabetes. We set out to, to bring peace and order to the, the, the gang townships. It became so good at, at a point where, just before COVID, when we went into places like Hanover Park or Mitchell's Plain or Manenberg, people would say, here come our people. It's simply because um, I, I tried to bring over a, a new kind of policing. For generations, Cape Flats communities have been under siege, ensnared in deadly criminal games of guns, drugs, and extortion. 
these courts have heard some of the most violent cases that have taken place as a result of the Capes gang wars. Someone with a front row seat and view of Cape Town's underworld is crime reporter Karen Dolly. There's a common misconception that gangsterism in the Western Cape is limited to the Cape Flats. That's incorrect. I'd go so far as to say that gangs have stretched their tentacles into the corporate sector, into law enforcement, into policing. As a court reporter, Karen Dolly has been mapping the interplay between gangs, crime bosses and corrupt police, fueled in recent years by a flood of illegal firearms to the Cape. We've heard in court how certain gangs control nightclub security and that is not limited to the Cape Flats. Those are in city centres, um, sort of what we know as party strips or party hubs. Long Street. It's a landmark strip popular amongst partygoers in Cape Town. It's also turf for criminal syndicates who demand payment from business owners here for protection. When somebody comes to you and forces down the service on you through intimidation to pay a certain fee for their services, that is what extortion is. And usually it involves organized crime rackets or gangs that profiteer from that illegal act of forcing or intimidating you to take their services. Former Major General Jeremy Vieri headed the detective services in the Western Cape, but was fired last year. He worked closely with Charles Kinnear on cases that prized open the underworld. Through every promotion that he had, I was on the panel. I had placed him in units that gradually led to him investigating deeper organized crime in this province. So by the time that I handed him over to the gang unit, he was seasoned in the type of investigations of organized crime and gang-related crime. Kinnear knew who controlled Cape Town's nightlife, and while delving into connections between gangs and crime bosses, one name kept cropping up. Nafis Modak was one of our prime targets. He was creating havoc in Cape Town. Um, whether it be individuals or business, or he, he was just all over the show. Um, and we knew also that he was doing everything in his power to try and infiltrate the anti-gang unit. If you ask Nafiz Modak himself, which I have for an interview a few years ago, he's made it very clear that he is just an ordinary businessman. If you ask a police officer who's investigating him, they would have a very different answer. And then if you ask certain individuals in the underworld, they will also have different answers ranging from he's just a wannabe, to this is a very dangerous person who should be, be afraid, be very afraid. Nafiz Modak is now in police custody and a heavy guard, awaiting trial with a number of co-accused. The trial against Nafiz Modak will be heard in September. He faces an astonishing number of charges, more than 3,000, including the murder of Charles Kinnear, other murders, attempted murders, dealing in illegal ammunition and firearms, and the list just goes on. But this mega case is only one element in Nicolette's struggle, which is pitting her against some of her husband's former colleagues. We know my husband was investigating the underworld, and we also know my husband was investigating corruption within the police. In 2018, Charles Kinnear submitted a detailed report alleging that a so-called rogue unit was operating in police criminal intelligence, sabotaging his work. I think that Lieutenant Colonel Schalk in his 59-page letter of complaint shows that the state has blood on its hands. And it's important to note that the crux of his complaint was that there were fellow police officers who were actively working against him and police officers perceived to be aligned to him. And what's more chilling is that he said that these police officers were using state resources not to fight crime, but effectively to stifle investigations him and his colleagues were busy with. Kinnear's report triggered a series of internal investigations. IPIT has now recommended laying formal charges against police officers. It's there on paper, but no timeline of action. The IPIT report into the murder of top detective Charles Kinnear was signed off on the 11th of May. It's meant to be tabled here in Parliament for a discussion, but no date has been set to interrogate the scathing report and the devastating findings of police failings. It's this roller coaster that we're going around and around and ticking boxes, and ultimately 
are feel wasting money and state resources. The IPAD report singles out Andre Lincoln for special censure and recommends the closure of the anti-gang unit. Right from the beginning, there was resistance from the, from the very top. There was resistance from the former National Commissioner to the formation of the anti-gang unit. Um, and they went out of their way to make sure that things didn't happen. For IPAD to call for the, 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 the disbanding of the anti-gang unit, I think um, they don't know what they're talking about. Both Andre Lincoln and Jeremy Vieri blame the top brass of the SAPS, including the former National Commissioner, Ketla Sitole. Aside from departmental investigations and the criminal investigations against the rogue unit that is recommended by the IPAD report, that civilians out there who were affected like the Kinnear family should be given the information to empower them to hold these individuals civilly liable. Police Minister Peggy Tele, the South African Police Service and IPAD said that the report needed first to be dealt with by Parliament before they could comment. The former police commissioner, Ketla Sitole, has also declined to comment. Back home, the wounds are still raw. Nicolette is laying a blanket charge of culpable homicide against all those named and shamed in the IPAD report. Her sons take issue with their father's mentors, including Jeremy Vieri. For years, he's been riding on my daddy's back. My dad was a great detective because he was a great detective. And for too long, it's been said that it's because of Yuri that can near climb the ranks. It's not. If you look at my dad's track record as well, in 29 years of being a police officer, he lost one case. Safety is Nicolette's immediate concern. This week, she learned she's to lose half her police protection. She's not taking it lying down. I've come to see a side that it bleeds for, for partners that's left behind and needing to deal with trauma and still all of the admin and everything else that goes with it. It's really, really a steep, a steep mountain to climb. I think she has picked up where her husband has left off in a sense. She knows she can play a role in preventing this from happening to someone else. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.